Okay, so Mercy or Nandra, you can feel free to start whenever you want. We are live. You want me to go? Okay, hi. Um, yeah, I'll go ahead. Okay, hi. My name is Mercia Kandukira. My Herero name is Kendo Uho. It means the little one with eyes. Um, and I was given this by my grandmother, my great grandmother. Um, I'm a student, I'm a PhD student at Binghamton University, and my research centers around the Herero and Nama genocide. Um, I, my, my last research trip to Namibia took me to um, Swakopmund, to Ludritzburg, and also to Charles Hill in Botswana, which is one of the first um, places that um, refugees in 1904 landed. They, they landed them and uh, that little town was established for them um, in 19, like in the late, in the early 1900s. I'm not sure now exactly, I'll have to look that up. Um, so while I was traveling in Namibia, I I was lucky to be around uh, a lot of Herero and Nama people, especially in Ventuk and in Ludritz. And um, I attended the, the genocide memorial walk, which brought people from South Africa and Botswana also to come and um, talk about their experiences as descendants of people who survived the genocide in South Africa and in, in, in Botswana. And there are also lots of Herero and Namibia in the diaspora. I am in the US, so and there are so many others also in the diaspora. And um, uh, how does Namibia now feature into the story um, of the ICJ? Um, for a very long time, the Herero and Nama communities have been um, trying to get Germany to acknowledge the genocide with little, with no support from the government. And then now um, we have news that uh, the government has spoken up on behalf of the Herero and Nama communities uh, to condemn Germany, uh, condemning Germany for condoning the genocide happening in Palestine. And so yeah, this is a, still a developing thing. Um, I, I won't say too much about it, but um, I my my point is just to come and read a poem. Uh, while I was visiting Ludritz, one of the speakers spoke about green hydrogen in the midst of our morning, our ancestors, which I thought was very uh, funny. Um, not funny in a not funny in a haha way, but more like funny peculiar. So. I wrote, I, I, I write also a lot about um, um, how like, you know, energy demands during these times also um, in a way has been used to kind of deflect attention away from our fight. And I remember somebody, uh, one of the speakers um, in Ludritz talking about green hydrogen when we were busy mourning our ancestors, uh, which I thought was disrespectful. Um, I'm going to read from a small piece that I've written, uh, which is titled um, Spook Asam. And um, I co-wrote this with, with uh, Leslie Haywood, who, is my, uh, who was my academic advisor. So um, it, it means quite a bit. So I'm I'm a writer, so that's what I do. I would prefer to to just read what I wrote, and then um, whatever questions come later on, we can have a discussion. Okay, so book awesome. I'll just read a snippet. Um, how much time do I have left? Um, maybe if you could also just introduce Nanre before reading your poem, and then we can do that. That would be great. Um, Marcia. So Nandre can introduce people in the panel and welcome people. Okay, could uh could Nandre introduce themselves if, if possible? Okay, um yeah, hi, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Nandre. Um and uh, welcome to our our panel today. Um we're very excited uh to be here. 
Um, so um, as you all know, the, today's panel is on shared narratives, um, Namibia and Palestine's collective stand against apartheid and genocide. Um, and we have the panelists here um, at, from Namibia, and they're also, I think Toivo will introduce them as, they, as they're about to come on. Um, so uh, just very briefly, uh, before we go into the poem, um, I think uh, we're all, uh, I think Toivo, do you want to introduce yourself because you're co-moderating with us and then I can talk about the, the ICJ a bit before we do the poem or? Absolutely. So this is, my name is Toivo, he, him pronouns. Um, I'm an organizer with uh, Community Movement Builders, uh, Malcolm X Grassroots Movement, as well as Black First Land First back in Azania, what most of you will know as South Africa. Um, yeah. Back to Nanre. Okay, thank you. And I think I didn't, so my name is Nanre. Um, I'm a Nigerian uh, and uh, I'm an organizer and a scholar. I'm with the Pan-African Activist Collective. Um, and I also teach in uh, Montreal, um, Canada. Um, and before we go into anything, actually, we wanted to hold um, a moment of silence um, because we're here today to talk about um, some very heavy topics. And so we are with um, we're using Palestine as a point of, of I guess as a kind of point of contact to talk about um, genocide um, that has happened, you know, in in our in in Namibia. And um, but we also want to acknowledge the current moment as well. So if we can hold a minute of silence for those who um, have lost their lives and who have transcended. Um, Okay, thanks everyone. Um, so I don't think I need to go much into the context um, of uh, what is happening today in uh, Palestine. Um, but as we know, uh, the conversation that we're having today emerges out of um, the past months of war, um, which have led to the death of over 26,000 Palestinians, including over 12,000 children. And um, one of the uh, main reasons that we are starting to have this conversation of, uh, about the connections, the global connections, of course, Palestinian and Black solidarity um, have been historic uh, ever since the, from the beginning of the struggle for Palestine. Um, and South Africa in this spirit of solidarity, or of course, I, we have speakers here today that might say any other reasons why South Africa was actually the first country to bring this case um, to the International Court of Justice. And as we all know, on Friday, the International Court of Justice delivered its rulings. Um, there are very many takes, and I think people are still unpacking. Of course, these are preliminary um, provisional measures that they're taking, and the final case on genocide is going to take, some say months, some say years, um, before the final decisions are made. Um, but South Africa, the ICJ did not order a ceasefire, as we know. Um, instead, it issued six different orders um, in relation to the bombardment of Gaza, but it fell short of actually calling for an, a, a ceasefire. Um, those provisional measures uh, will have different repercussions, um, but bringing Namibia into the conversation today, I'm going to hand it back over to Marcia um, and Toivo to continue the conversation on the connections to Namibia. Thank you. Oh, and just, uh, sorry, just one more technical note. Um, <clears throat> I see people already using the chat, but please, we do want to make this interactive, even though it's a webinar. So if you have questions, uh, please drop them in the chat. If you have organizations that you're representing that you want us to um, know about, please drop, feel free to drop also the names of your organizations in the chat as well, so we can also uh, continue to make uh, this as interactional and generative as possible. Thank you.
Okay, Marcia, if you want to do your poem now, that would be great. Okay, so um, I guess to get us started, um, I could share uh, the declare the statement, the, the joint declare, uh, basically a joint statement uh, between the Nama Traditional Leaders Authority and the Ovaero Leaders Ovaero Traditional Authority. They have a, a document that I was going to maybe start share share what they wrote, their take on the case, and then uh, open up the room for everyone to ask questions or to 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 chime in and no. <laughs> okay, so so yeah, let's let's get talking. Um Oh yeah, I was supposed to read my let me read my story, my poem. Sorry. Let me read my poem. Um so this is um Spook Asa. I'll just read a, a little snippet of it because it's uh it's quite long. So I'll just read like a the start of it. Um it is about uh the energy demands of course of living out here in um upstate New York, but it's also about um almost losing my dad to an accident and uh remembering him as as a little girl, how you know the little things that he used to do and all that stuff. And I guess within the spirit of what we're doing now is that a lot of people in Palestine and you know where the war is happening are losing their family members, they're losing people that they could have created memories with. And uh, just with that thought, I'm gonna um, start reading this one. Okay, it's book awesome. One morning during an upstate New York winter, I stood barefoot in a t-shirt towel over my shoulder and turned the knob. The gas stove hissed, rattled, and spoofed up an orange-tinged blue flame and startled me. I reduced the intensity and placed the mocha on the burner. The espresso sputtered and the apartment smelled of medium roast coffee. I asked and Siri informed me it was seven degrees Fahrenheit outside. I zipped my top coat up with gloved hands, stepped out, backpack snug against my layers. I live on a busy street in an industrial zone that is also partly residential. And often the emissions from the vehicles passing burn my throat. My exhales are thick like cotton candy. My dad once bought me cotton candy wrapped in a clear polythene bag when I was maybe 10. When I asked what the stuff was, he had said that it was spook asam. I frowned, a ghost's breath. But with the climate change crisis and the mass extinction of species, the thought that a modern human like me could be a ghost in is not far-fetched, especially if innocent looking routines such as mine continue unchecked. The year my dad bought me cotton candy was the year I lost my cousin to a snake bite on a colonial reservation called Omutiwanduko in Namibia. She got bitten, wrapped her finger in her loin napkin's hem, and kept playing. By the time my grandmother noticed the venom had spread, years later, I was in a first aid class and the teacher said, not all snakes in Namibia are venomous, but if you see a snake, you must assume it is venomous, steer clear of it. Now, oil companies, when I hear fracking, my mind rushes to Namibia's scarcest resource, water, I think of my retired father's newly acquired land in the Chicago region and how fracking might affect his garden and the few animals that will sustain the family for years. I asked him how close his land is to his fracking zone and he tells me not to worry because it's far away, but I worry because water flows. I'm just gonna stop it here. 
and I can read the rest at the end, please. Okay, folks. Um, thank you so much for that, Moshe. So, okay, folks. So, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give about 15 minutes of just some context. We wanted to start off with some of the now stuff, right? Because the prop, one of the things that we have had issues with, and I know others can agree, is that when we talk about populations and peoples who have been victims and survivors of genocide, they become almost like people who don't exist right now, who aren't alive right now. You feel me? Right. Um, and so part of Palestinian solidarity, part of Namibian solidarity is to center and highlight those voices who are alive right now and who are fighting and doing all they can to live, breathe, love and be happy and repair the harm that was done to their peoples. Right. So we want to start now with the now and with me, I will take us back historically a bit. Um, and while, of course, uh, we do uh, people like their land land acknowledgements. Right. One of the land acknowledgements I would like to give for our area here in uh, Georgia. Um, also in part inspired by our engagements and grounding with the Palestinian struggle, right? And our Palestinians um, will know and other allies will know what this is. We wish to talk about the right of return, right? And so the land acknowledgement in Georgia is to say, yes, there were a number of Muscogee Cree uh, Native American peoples who were here prior to white settler colonialism, but also there were enslaved Africans, as we know, who were brought here to work um, on the plantations. And so one of the groups of people here, um, distinct Afro-American groups is called the Gullah Geechee peoples, right? Um, and they're all along the South Carolina, North Carolina, Georgia, Florida, uh, a coastline, if you will, called the low country, right? There's like an area where you find these folks, right? And one of the situations I wanna talk about is a place called Harris Neck, right? Where a whole bunch of um, uh, Gullah Geechee folks, folks were kicked off their land by the US government in 1942. And to this day, they still fight for the right to return to their land. I bring that up because those of you who know Palestinians, much of the fight of the Palestinian uh, diaspora, as well as the struggle at home, is the right to return. Hence, while we talk about this as a genocidal project, as a white settler colonial project, because their right to return home is being denied. So something similar in some ways, so also when we think about in Namibia right now, um, the right to return, particularly for our um, Ovejero peoples and Nama peoples and other peoples who have lost land in the center and south of our country, right? And when it, Namibia became independent in 1990, we still have not returned that land to those peoples. So when Germany talks about reparations, reparations without land redistribution is a non-starter, right? Similar when we talk about Palestinian liberation, there must be the right to return for land. It's not just we want a two-state solution because much of that land and what people claim will be this Israel is land that was Palestinians and the entire land is not theirs in the first place, right? This is why we believe in a one-state solution and we believe in the right of return. So with that being said, I'm going to briefly share my screen, um, if I'm able to. Uh, so folks can, of course, I'm looking at my thing and of course, uh, there we go. Um, I'm going to briefly share my screen and I'm going to sort of do some sort of historical stuff now. And I'm starting my timer for about 15 minutes. So let's get this thing started. So for those of you who want to know, right, this is, um, if you will, the map of the continent, right? And Namibia is located here. Um, its colonial name was called German Southwest Africa. Literally, the laziness of the colonial colonialists um, is very clear. Literally, it's south and it's west, right? Um, so uh, uh, besides being colonial bastards, their namings are very unimaginative, right? South Africa, right? So there's many places I could start. And I guess the one place we, I think we always must start, and I think it's very important, particularly when we begin to think of this region that we're looking at right now, right? Is that all these borders you see here, I want you to eliminate them from your, from your mind if you can. These borders are European borders that were created and designed for their purposes and their rivalries and their ideas of how Africans would be divided up in their empire. It took hundreds of years for them to get to this point. We must always emphasize that. It's not like Europeans rolled up and then they colonized everybody in 10 years and started pushing slaves and gold and silver and ivory out of Africa. It took them hundreds of years and we were kicking ass and taking names um, prior to these things happening, right? So what I want people to think about is that in the 1500s is essentially when, if you think about Christopher Columbus, he was supposed to go off and to quote unquote, what? Find this route to India. And of course he quote unquote, discover slash invades, right? Uh, what we now call North America, right? The Caribbean and these areas, right? But when they realized that that wasn't the route to India, there was people, the Portuguese who had to finish the job. And that's where they began to encounter this area in Southern Africa right here. 
So in the 1500s, you see Cape Town down here, right? You see some of these areas down here. This is when they first begin, the Portuguese begin to make certain sorts of stops and eventually on their route to the Indian Ocean. And then eventually the Dutch come and really what would be um, 1492 for those uh, here in the Western Hemisphere, right? For us, uh, 1656, 15, 1656, 15, 1657 is roughly our date when we think of Van Veek, uh, uh, Van Riebeck, right? Van, Van Riebeck, right? These Dutch white settlers are, who are leaving Europe and basically looking for a colonizing space in the African continent, right? And so they begin here, right? We zoom down here. Those of you who know your Sarah Bartman, right? If you know your Sarah Bartman stories, right? Sarah Bartman is being kidnapped in this area here, right? Um, quote unquote, the Hottentot Venus, right? It was how they how she was referred to. Her ancestors are the ones who are here prior to. And I begin here, not up in Namibia, because many of the people who you see here in Reobot, right, and South Ventuk, right, many people south of this area here, right, many of them are coming from migrations that are being forced, given the white settler presence in Southern Africa. Right. The Boers, Afrikaners and the British. Right. These are these people who are now uh, the Boers and Afrikaners, of course, coming into themselves on the African continent. And then the British coming through, of course, now um, and, to, and you know, ruling this, this world empire, as we all know. Right. And so in the white settler colonial project, they begin to push people up north. Right. And so over time, you have admixtures between different ethnic groups and nations. Yes, there is white there. We know what happens on these plantations with the rape and sexual assault on these plantations. Right. Uh, and you are having um, new generations that are born of these unions. Right. And so a whole bunch of people who admixtures are there. New cultures are being created while the while the ancient cultures are trying to preserve themselves in the face of this genocide that happens here. Right. And I use the term genocide because just because it only got created in the 20th century doesn't mean we don't use it in other centuries. This is important to understand because this is who begins to fill up what we now call Namibia's southern area. Those of us from the north, we begin to flow to this area here. Right. Basically, in roughly two migration waves. The first one. Right. Um, is what sort of brings to what we to Namibia now your over Herero populations. Um, as well as other groups, and then more of your second wave is different Vambu populations here in the north of the country that are fleeing the slave trade on the continent and the colonial project throughout the region. This is important because when we fast forward to the, this happens between the 1500s and the 1800s. This is important because when we fast forward to the late 19th century, this is when many of you would have heard of the the like, like uh, the Berlin Conference, right? 1884 to 1885, right? And it is here where um, the white colonists begin to divide up Africa to sort of bring some order to their own fights. Right. Germany is late to the colonial game, right? Because their economy was generally stronger than the other European countries. They didn't need shall we say, the uh, foreign colonies as much as others did. And they don't really actually have a lot of warm water ports, many of you who know Germany, right, given where their ports are. And so it was difficult for them to get as involved in the colonial game as others, but eventually they do. And they take Tanganyika, parts of Cameroon, and then uh, Namibia, what is now Namibia. This is important because here, right, Namibia is very deserty, as you can see. They basically land in this area here on the coast and they begin to colonize outward through divide and conquer. So if you remember when I talked about the different groups that were coming from the north and from the south, they are interacting right here in this space. And like any interactions, right? Some of it is good. Some of it also has levels of conflict. But the level of conflict we must understand is not industrial war, conflict, killing of hundreds of people on battlefields. That is not how people were engaging. People are stealing cattle. They're stealing women. They're stealing uh, 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 foodstuffs. My, right. Um, there's conflict here and there, but it's not like, you know, one uh, overhead or group is wiping out another Nama group and they're wiping them out and enslaving them, you know, on planet. This is not what's happening. Right. Um, so when the Germans come, they introduce a whole different way of modern vicious warfare. Right. Um, and eventually um, what ends up happening is that the, the groups in the center and south of the country, people like uh, uh, Samuel Maharero, people like um, uh, Jacob Morenga uh, or Morengo, depending on how you want to uh, how people uh, say it. Um, and Hendrik Wittboy, Isaac Wittboy, many of these different uh, 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 croppers, these different types of, I would say, our first wave of liberation movement fighters, right, begin to fight the Germans, right? Um, and in 1904, there's a general uprising, and this is essentially where we argue the Herero and Nama uh, genocide uh, begins, right? 
because they bring in this vicious commander uh, named Lothar von Trotter, and Lothar von Trotter um, uh, releases what's called Ein Vernichtigungsbefehl auf Deutsch. So those who to translate directly, Vernichtigung, as I would translate, and others who know German can disagree or agree, Vernichtigung is annihilation, wipeout. Why? Why do they want to wipe out the people who are living here? Because they want to create a term that those who understand the Holocaust should understand and know called Lebensraum, living space, right? So when Adolf Hitler is talking about Lebensraum in, Raum in Mein Kampf, right? He's talking a lot about Eastern Europe for sure, but he's also talking about arguments that were saying we need to give living space for Germans in Africa, right? And we need to kick out those who, and we need to kick out those who are less than us, the backward African peoples. We need to kick them off this land and wipe them out. Now, of course, as you know, there's a debate in the capitalists to say, well, wait a second. If we wipe out all the worker people here, who are the workers who are going to do those labors in the diamond mines on the coast, etc.? So you see the tension amongst the whites. Do we wipe them all out for Lebensraum or do we have to have an enslaved low wage labor population? This is important because when we talk about the Nama genocide, and I'm sure Keith and others can speak better to this than myself, right, is that it takes place over a little different uh, time period, and it happens differently. So you have a whole bunch of concentration camps that are built in Hentis Bay and parts here on the coast here, you see my arrow, right, where they begin to put many of the Namas who were resisting in these work camps, where they just begin to die out in these horrible conditions in these concentration camps. Herero, men, women, and children are killed, and people like Mercia, our other comrade Thrive, who is not able to be here with us right now, are survivors of that genocide. As Mercia said, um, many Herero were pushed into Botswana. So if I zoom out the map right now and you see Botswana, many Herero are actually here. For, or at least the descendants, right? Um, the numbers that we have is 90% of the Herero and about 50 to 80% of the Nama and other groups were wiped out in this 1904 to 1915 period. I'm not going to dwell too much on this because I want people who are the survivors of that genocide to speak for themselves, right? More on how they want, what they wish to talk about with that. I wanted to give this for an audience that might not know some broad sweeps of this. When we now jump forward, we also want to jump forward to the late 1940s, which we know in the post-World War II moment, there were a whole bunch of shifts. Namibia initially now... Namibia, the center and southern part of the country, was secured by the Germans. But the north, where some of us were from, given some of our exposures to some of the Portuguese and given some of our own unique social factors, we were not, if you will, conquered directly in that sense. Right? Um, but eventually we are brought into colonial relations through this migrant labor system because they wiped out people in the central and south part of the country. So bamboo men right, like my father and grandfather and my granduncles and these folks are sent down to the cities and the mines to work for contracts. And this becomes the embryo for uh, the swap of what would become the Southwest Africa People's Organization, right, in the 1960s, right, in terms of what they would emerge to become, right? In the, so in 1915, what's important to understand is when, when World War I happens, the whites in South Africa here who were given independence by the British invade Namibia and they take it for the British, if you will. We are then handed over after World War II to the League of Nations as a mandate territory, essentially saying we're going to help get you to independence. And the white South Africans are the ones who are going to bring you guys to civilization, essentially racist nonsense. Right. This is why we care little. Some of us for the U.N. and ICJs in some of these places. This is all their legacy. Right. Um, we know what happens in World War II. Many of us are conscripted to go fight in World War II. My grandfather among them is forced to go fight on my father's side. And my namesake, Andimba Tuevo Yotuevo, one of our liberation movement fighters, is sent to go fight in World War II. After World War II, uh, World War II the, na the racist National Party comes into power in South Africa, and they bring a more conservative sort of uh, brand of white supremacy to both Namibia, what they call Southwest Africa, and South Africa. The late 1940s is important, as many of you know, also for numerous reasons, right? In, 1940, in the late 1940s, right, we also we, we have what many of you know as the Nakba, right? The Nakba is the catastrophe, right? In 1948, right? Where basically the Palestinians, in similar fashion to how the Germans did with the Herero, the Ova Herero and the Nama peoples, they're kicking people off land for their own Lebensraum, right? And so this now, again, is launching Palestinian resistance, which had always been there even earlier, 
right? Because people saw, particularly in the wake of World War II, what was about to happen, right? The reason why, again, if we go back to my original um, division of the country into this north and south is because it's important to understand that while the genocide happened in the central and southern parts of the country, right, us in the north, it did not happen to us in that way. This doesn't mean we didn't suffer, we didn't have people who died in some of our conflicts with the Germans, and then later, of course, the Boers, and particularly in our liberation struggle. But we were not directly impacted in that sense. And so today you can see the disproportional number of Vambus, if you will, in the country, which is over 50% of the population, right? If not 60%, right? Um, and then the other 12 ethnic groups divide the other bit of it is because of the genocide in large part. And my argument is that Swapo Party, the Southwest Africa People's Organization, while indeed it had representation from all the different ethnic groups in Namibia, it is disproportionately Ovambo, right? Or Shiwambo speaking us in the North. Right. And so given this, right, when independence finally comes, right, for us in 1990, right, for us in 1990, um, uh, uh, I would like to argue that while there were certain radical wings in the party pushing for a deeper land redistribution policy, right, because of some of the negotiatedness of our independence, given the fall of the Soviet Union and the lack of us being able to kind of force the whites uh, to, to give up their land, we had to, some would argue that we had to uh, concede for the short term, the land qu redistribution question as Zimbabwe had done in 1990 and as we knew South Africa was about to do in their negotiated independence. The 1960s, of course, is when Swapo kind of rises really as, the, if you say, the, the, the major liberation movement in Namibia. We also in Palestine have the Six Day War, as people will know in 1967. In 1973, we have the Yom Kippur, right? War, right? Um, in 1987 to 1993, so right this period when Namibia and South Africa are becoming independent, right? We have the first intifada. Right. The first intifada is important, as many people know, because this is now where now after more, more than 40 years of this white settler colonial project, different groups like Fatah, the PFLP, uh, you know, the wider PLO organization and some of the allies in the Middle East. Right. The Arab states are some of them with good intentions trying to fight for Palestine. There's, it's just a tough going. It's a tough out. And so then you see resistance in Palestine shift from the exile movements to the internal movements. Right. So then inside the occupied territories, people are beginning to uprise. And this is where you begin to see the second intifada, sorry, the first intifada. This is what sort of essentially brings Hamas to a certain level of prominence. 1993 is important because it's the Yom Kippur, uh, sorry, it's the Oslo Accords, right? So part of the agreements for this two-state solution that we begin to talk about happened in this 1993 moment with Arafat kind of going to Camp David and some, Camp David and some of these agreements, right? 1994, important because we have South Africa's independence. So we see what's sort of happening around here, right? And very much in the 1980s in particular, the anti-apartheid movement very much saw Namibia, South Africa, and the Palestine stuff as very interconnected. Now we know a new generation of people. We know a new generation of people. Yeah, um, I see you, Nanre. We know a new generation of people. Um, uh, 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 we know a new generation of people, right? Uh, most definitely we're pushing for a different sort of solution. Um, for some of the different things that were happening. But this, in some sense, is the broad strokes of what's happening um, in, in some of the global forces. In the mid-2000s, we have our second intifada, and here's where we see Namibia and other countries begin to deal with the independence question. So my time is basically up, but I'd like to leave with a few comments before I introduce Keith, who's going to go next for us. What I wanted to say is while Namibia became independent and began to have a radical, again, as governments go, a particular kind of a radical project, part of why we've brought Keith Hildegard and um, uh, Thrive and Mercia here is because very much while it was a certain level of a radical movement, the decolonial project was not yet complete. Hildegard can speak to some of these things as well as Keith, but we want to talk about is now the idea of the hetero and nama genocide. These things were not being taught in schools as, as regularly as they should have been, right? Um, some of the discourse was around reconciliation and not centering the race question as much, right? Which I think uh, prevented the particular conversations from happening. Many of the leadership who are disproportionately Vambu, I believe don't have some of the direct connection to the genocide as those who are survivors of it do and so have not cared as much. I believe many also who are in cahoots with some of these, these big landowners is a problem, right? And so while Namibia is on one level a success story in some ways, in many le levels, the contradictions are actually very, very serious. And this is why a new generation of activists has emerged 
right, to now push the country and the region in a different direction. It's part of why we wanted to bring some of these folks here today, particularly to have that conversation. We don't want you just to look at Namibia and to just see and just to think of Namibia only as a place where there was genocide or we were supporting in the anti-apartheid struggle. People are living and breathing and fighting new struggles and new projects today. And with that, I'm going to pass it over to Keith. And so Keith, we went to high school together, by the way. Um, so it's very great seeing, um, and Keith was a great debater. It was great. I love being in high school with Keith was great. And so uh, now I will bring it over to Keith, roughly 15, 20 minutes, if you could. And then we will have uh, Hildegard uh, come up. Um, so Keith, uh, about 15, 20 minutes, please check your chats. I'm going to send you just a time check. Even though I'm going over my time, I apologize. But please, uh, the floor is yours, Keith. Good afternoon, good morning, good evening, everybody. My name is Keith Fries. I'm a Namibian poet, writer, and activist. Um, we've been given some like guidelines about how to keep the conversation as fluid as possible. So I'd like to follow those as much as possible, just so that we have like a common brace from which to operate. But that being as it may, I thought I'd start with a poem myself, since I'm a poet, and I mean, most of my poetry is based around the genocide. So I specifically uh, only write about um, 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 the genocide that happened in Namibia. You'll notice that I might not say Heronama genocide because I think there's some um, contestations there as well that need to be discussed. So because the San people and the Damara people are also calling to be included into the conversation around uh, um, who has a share to, you know, victimhood in this in this case. So I want to leave room for that. But I'll read you a poem that was read at the, uh, the Berlinale when um, when these people made the movie, this recent movie, The Measure of Men, that was sort of like um, telling the story of the Namibian genocide from a hero woman's perspective. But that's apparently not how it came out in the end. Uh, that's also up for debate. And this poem is called Stories About Those Who Can't Speak. Stories about people like me can only be written on the drought-infected grounds of now forgotten towns like Beersheba, towns who, without the presence of its overlords, still serve as servants' quarters, in a country that once bore a name more terrifying than the one that it is called now, Namibia. Stories about people like you are written with gilded pen and are embalmed in history, in the histories of places like Hamburg, to be stored in the cultural vaults on the high streets of our collective memory. These stories that you write about yourselves are actually monuments and statues, which guard over the privileges pillaged and plundered elsewhere, close to the now drought-infected grounds of places like Kwakhanas, this wealth will be used to build a new master's house in a safer place, far away from the tortured history in this place where he lives now, a place that still bears the same terrifying name as it did back then, Deutschland. Some stories have tendencies of picking up fallacies depending, dependent on their authors. They're evidently bent and contorted to suit the safeties, securities, and sanctimonious civilizations of those who dig with the gun and farm with blood and drink of denial while telling stories at dinner tables with children around, reminiscing on adventure and conquest in our disgraced places. Well, it should be known then that the history in the Namib Desert has remained the same since 1904 and beats down upon the people in long rays of landlessness and burns them with the memory of yesterday and tomorrow's hunger and humiliations and displacements in a lands that he once roamed in great strides in a symbiotic dance with fauna and flora for 2000 years. But things have changed since then and now our eyes bleed red. So please do not look us in the face for we cannot permit anyone else to fallaciously bear witness again to our fossilizing grief and displacement an exile which has us stuck and languishing in the closed mouth of a silent history, a 100 year old story which is already 26 years into preparing itself for another long rest on the dusty shelves of another century's problems. And so the symphony of those who have bestowed power upon themselves continues to play on in the background as it does the fall. The song that is sung is a classic, a murderous masterpiece, a 100 year old ode to those that gave you life and gave long suffering to us and ours, leaving us in a place with people that now call themselves St. Vester, who built supermarkets on top of mass graves and use the private sector to hide the shames of a nation 12,000 kilometers away. This history has made the people whom these poems are about living ancestors and sentient ghosts 
who dwell in the Namib without rest, on the central, on the central plateau of Thomas with intent of vengeance, in the red dunes of the Almaheke Desert with purpose, near the ocean in Namingus seeking retribution, and in the forests of Ochimbingwe casting spells. Still we dwell, all of us, at the crime scene, which lays paved on the high streets of our collective consciousness and plays on in the background and the fore, in uncovered graves, in stolen lands. Still we all dwell at the crime scene, on top of landlessness and on top of graves. Still we dwell. So I think I just wanted to read that um, to give context to what I write about and what it is that I seek to achieve in my writing. So let me start here. I think what's important for people to understand that haven't grown up the way that we have grown up in Namibia, particularly those of us that both had the privilege and the misfortune of going to German schools, which are in Namibia, the best schools are is first the English school, which is St. Paul's, and then the German um, um, uh, schools fall in right behind that. So it would be Delta Secondary School and, and DHPS, uh, which is like the typically styled German high school that you find in the diaspora. And we we grow up sort of like snacking on German, you know, treats. Our street names are in one side, it says, let's say Keith Free Street. And on the other side, it says Keith Free Strasse, you know, so there's our street names on one side in German and in the other side in English. The most popular tourist destination in the country is a, is a town that looks like it's a small um, German town, which is Swakopmund, which lies at the coast, very haunting um, German, uh, German um, um, architecture. And haunting not just because it's like nostalgic German architecture, but because it was also built using the slave labor of those very camps uh, that uh, Teufel spoke about a little bit uh, in, in his presentation. So for me, I think we don't grow up, we don't realize growing up as Namibians, what kind of internal conflict is caused in our, in our persons as people, because first and foremost, you're not taught extensively about this history of the genocide and who truly fell victim, victim to it. Um, just as a side note, one thing I really love, love and hate, obviously, at the same time, because um, these are people that are being murdered uh, unjustly right in front of our eyes. But one thing I love and sort of like hold a slight envy for when I think about the Palestinian people's cause is it's so wonderful that at least we have a record of who those people are who have lost their lives. As in way in the Namibian case, you know, we were chased into the desert, uh, uh, killed there, our bones were left there. Um, the world was doing whatever it was doing at that point, um, launching other colonial conquests. So even when we try and trace ourselves back in our particular history, trying to find back from who do we actually descend as, as, as survivors and who are the murdered people, we have an information gap. This besides the point that a lot of the artif artifacts and books and things that were taken from Namibia are kept in German museums and are, uh, we don't have the access to. You have to be a certain kind of black as things stand to be able to even access those spaces and to be able to appear in front of that history, uh, things that we are still contending with. So I think the first thing I just wanted to point out is like a lot of people don't know, um, like in Tanzania, for instance, or in Cameroon, a lot of the Germans that were there in those areas had left after the colonial conquest uh, as it was known at, or as it was fashioned at that point had happened, right? But in Namibia, we continue to live, like I guess a lot of Zimbabwe, uh, a lot of what happened in Zimbabwe with, with the English, and I guess in South Africa with the Boers, is we continue to live on with our white colonial um, oppressors uh, or, or settlers. And it creates a very toxic relationship between your need for like wanting to assimilate and aspire for certain kinds of uh, lifestyles and, and certain things that you are taught are, are ways that a successful black life must end or a ways that a su successful black life must articulate itself. And then you come, you grow up and you, you start to understand, oh crap, your best friend from high school's dad was a Nazi, like a second generation Nazi. And then you have to grapple with this kind of history. So we are left with, 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 this, with this very real time toxic relationship, uh, living with what we call German Namibians, St. Vesters. And you must excuse me, and I'd like someone to jump in and stop me if I'm making false equivalents here. But I, as, as I was thinking about preparing myself for, for today's discussion, I was thinking about what kind of equivalent can I draw between the Palestinian people and ourselves um, to really try and explain why Namibia feels so strongly about what's happening to the Palestinian people and why it's such an outrage for us as a people that both suffered under apartheid and genocide to watch something like this happen right in front of our faces. So I wanted to say, if you could imagine with me for a second that 1904 Namibia, Southwest Africa, as it was called then by the German Southwest Africa, 
as it was called then by the Germans. If you could imagine that to be the Gaza Strip of today, and you imagine the West Bank to be the Namibia that we live in today. So if, if I could draw that, that, that parallel, it's the murdering and the almost annihilation of our people that we experience is what the Palestinian people are experiencing in the Gaza Strip right now. Now, if you fast forward a 100 years, and, and people have been given some kind of power to be able to run uh, a government that still sort of like toes the line between like um, uh, uh, true justice and equity for people versus like making sure that they appease the colonial settler that, that essentially governs over them as, as we, we all know is what's happening with the PRA, right? Um, so you imagine that the West Bank, Germans are about 30,000 Germans are left in Namibia out of almost roughly 2.3, 2.5, 2.6 .2 million people. And they own 70% of all the habitable land in the country, all the commercial and habitable land. The rest of it is kind of like desert, um, unexplored, really beautiful land. But that's the kind of um, parallel that I wanna make. It's like, we live under the gaze of freedom because the narrative on which the country's independence is built is not built necessarily on defeating colonial forces, i.e. the Germans, but more so the South African government uh, with, the, with the birth of uh, the Ovambo People's Movement, which, which uh, later becomes sort of more intersectional, so to speak, and becomes um, the Swapo Party as we know it. Um, um, so Namibia's history, as it's known, both by those of us that went through the schooling system and those of those that are in power now, which is uh, in a lot of ways the Black elite, which have taken over the narrative for where the country birth was or where we started fighting for the country because once you start claiming um liberation uh struggle credentials you automatically seem to have access to the power structures in the country right so you if you if you want to for instance declare henry good boy or Jose Kutako or samuel maherero as one of like the founding fathers of the namibian nation you immediately put um swapo's narrative and um the predominant uh Awambo narrative as it relates to politics and not to the people in general um, in disrepute, right? So we, we are not only dealing with, um, um, as a people now, and I speak specifically as a Nama person, because I've, I've seen a lot of people even describe this genocide as the hero genocide, you know? And long, you'll hear people talk at long stretches and not do the effort of, you know, just saying, for instance, the, the uh, Nama hero genocide, or I like to say the Nama hero son, um, uh, uh, Nama, Herero, San, and Damra genocide because those people generally lived in the same area and probably uh, experienced the same kind of violence. So there is a lot of erasure happening even when we talk about the genocide and how we talk about the genocide. And this is happening with, I guess, if I'm going to draw another parallel, the murdering of Palestinian journalists on the ground because what's very important for, for a settler colonial culture is to erase the narrative of the people on the ground and make sure that they don't have a a space to speak and articulate what it is that they, they deem um, wrong with the, with, the, with the settler colonial culture and what it is that they want when they are free from that particular uh, violent regime. And that kind of thing happens in Namibia. So even when you look at the condemnation of the Namibian government um, as it's talking, talking about this genocide and it condemns uh, 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 Germany for, for joining um, uh, Israel in its ICG um, um, uh, uh, conversation, you find that the Namibian uh, government in that press release that came from the president's office does not once mention the word Herero or Nama in that in that uh, circular that they sent out and say the Namibian people, right? Now, if you say the Namibian people, I think it's fair enough to say it's the Namibian people because I think we all contribute to the to the to the work that gets done around getting the word out there and really embodying this history and making it very personal because as Ubuntu Gumuntu Gabantu, what happens to one black person happens to the other. And so we assume each other's pain. Um, and in so that way, I do think it's a Namibian struggle, but I don't see what necessarily becomes toxic about calling it um, the struggle of the people that died uh, uh, during the genocide. So uh, that's just another interesting thing about me um, uh, that I wanted to point out, thinking about even how long it took for international media to use the term genocide when we knew in the second or third week that was this was a genocide. You know, so it's the use of language and the use of narrative production should be one of the things that we should be continue to be very anxious about. Who gets to tell our stories? From what angles do they get to be told? Because even as even as even when you talk about apartheid uh, in South Africa, you'll never hear. Thank you. You'll never hear that 
um, uh, 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 people say apartheid in Namibia and South Africa, but we went through the exact same system. So people always say the apartheid that happened in South Africa. So I experienced a lot of feelings of erasure, which is compounded by the fact that the genocide happened. And right after the genocide, we enter a period of apartheid. So it's almost like for the last 120 years, as Namibians, we have just lived under settler, um, settler colonialism, and we haven't had a chance to build narratives and make sure that we are free. I haven't had much time, so let me just run to the back end of what I wanted to say. Um, um, I think why, for me as an activist and a poet, meetings and gatherings like this are important is because we, if we, if the Zionists are having the same meeting and are strategizing and are making sure that uh, the narratives are being built to continue erasing Palestinian voices, then it is imperative for me to be able, for us to be able to gather on platforms like this and be able to share the work that we've done. I wish maybe Hildegard would talk a little bit about Kurt, Kurt von Francois and that movement and how that statue came down, which is a great marker, I think, of like post-independence resistance from young people in Namibia to say, yes, we're gonna come for symbols as well. Granted that the conversation around land is so politicized, we're gonna start attacking the German colonial settler culture, there, wherever we may find it as we live our lives in on stolen land. And I think um, uh, I wanted to use a term, because Toivo, you brought something up when you're talking. I wanted to use a term around what it means to live as a landless person in Namibia. And I think what I wanted to say is we should consider ourselves to be internally displaced people because we are caught up inside. We live in the ghettos. We live on the fringes of society. So just because Namibians are on Namibian land doesn't mean that our cause is not as urgent as it might be elsewhere. Because I think we are social, socioeconomically and politically um, internally displaced persons who are still living at the crime scene, like my poem suggested, with the person who basically murdered and almost tried to an annihilate us. Uh, if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to send them, but I think I'll leave it there for now. Uh, I skipped quite a bit, but... Uh, yeah, I feel pretty. No, good. no, no. Thanks, Keith. Keith. Um, um, yeah. For those of you who know the debate stuff, man, Keith was our third speaker. Uh, you know what I mean? That's that. That's usually the one come with the fire. Um, so um, that's Keith right there. And so I'm gonna now introduce um Hildegard. But before I do, I'm gonna do a quick two minute context for people. So I do think it's important that we understand some of this stuff and why Hildegard and some of the movements that Hildegard pushed for some of the decolonization stuff is very important contextually. It's important to understand what apartheid now did to Namibia. This is now when you begin to see the building of Ventuk, Swakopmund, Walvis Bay as industrial cities, uh, industrial, but urban cities as you will. And apartheid is this idea of separation. Those of you in the US, the context was separate but equal apparently. Now, of course, we know that shit wasn't equal, but the idea was it was the separation, the division. So in the city, what began to happen is you have the separation between whites and blacks and some of the uprisings in the late 1950s, even a place called Katutura, right? We talk about the old location, right? People who are Namibians will know what this is, basically the displacement of people in the city, right? And so what you also have in Katutura, and if you will, the township, the hood, right, would basically be a division, right, between the different ethnic groups. The idea we have Damara Lokasi, the Damaras live here, Namas live here, Bambus live here, Hereros live here, to even separate us within blackness. And so what Keith is saying is very important is that what has happened is, is that us Vambus in the north who did not lose our land in that way, right? And disproportionately who do have access to the state, disproportionately, not everybody, right? But disproportionately, right? In some senses, it's almost as Keith is saying that there's privileges in how we move, right? That's why it's important that we center the other uh, activists, right? And we have been part of the problem, many ways. And I believe Swapo has failed. Um, our people in the center and south of the country dismally on the land question in the name of modernization and industrialization. So I wanted to say that, and the city itself, like the city center, is very much still a white colonial city, right? Um, and that's part of what's being fought. And so now I'm going to switch to uh, Hildegard. Please, Hilda, uh, twenty about 20 minutes or so, I'll message you just a quick time check. Um, and then we'll ask, uh, Mer then we'll have Mercia say a few comments, to uh, comments, and then a Q&A. Those of you who are in the chat, please write your questions and send them to us. You can send them to me or send them to others so we can uh, uh, share your questions with the group and we can ask, okay? So please share your questions with in the wider chat or hit me up and then later on we can ask these questions for the panelists so they can communicate with you. Hilda, uh, please take it away. Hi, everyone. Um, can you all hear me? Awesome. Okay, cool. Um, hi, yeah, so my name is Hilda God. And um, 
yeah. Uh, thank you to all the other speakers and to Keith, especially. Um, so fun fact is Keith and I were actually, we met in a debating competition like almost 16 years ago. And it's wild how like, you know, time passes and spicy people are always the spicy people. Um, but yeah, so basically what I want to talk about today was just about the similarities between the Namibian, um, the, 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 between Namibia and Palestine. And then I'll try and touch on the Kurt statue stuff towards the end if I still have time. Um, but yeah, I mean, I was having a conversation with some friends as all of this is happening. And I realized that Namibia is essentially the settler's dream. You know, like Keith has mentioned and Osa's Toyba has mentioned is like, essentially what the settler wants is to be able to take over the land and be able to have their Lehman's realm and, you know, essentially thrive and live their best life. Like Keith mentioned, like Moon is one of the most popular, um, what you call it, tourist destinations. 70% um, of the land is still owned by, you know, the white population, which doesn't even make like a dent in terms of percentage of the country. Um, but yeah, like I just want to do some parallels. I mean, obviously, like, it's not to like, you can't compare, but there's the similarities are very, very evident. Um, like even starting from like, you know, with the genocide um, against the Bajerero Nama and some people was with the, with the extermination order, right? Like it was very important that they gave a order, like Philosopher von Trotter gave an order to the people so that they would know that they were no longer German subjects. And you can see the parallels of what's happening in Palestine in terms of like Israel, like giving out pamphlets and being like, hey, you need to move out of here if you don't move you know, you're going to die. And that's the same thing that happened to, like, you know, the Ovajere the, the Nama, where they were told, like, if you don't leave, you're going to be exterminated. If you come back, you're going to be exterminated. The other parallels is also this thing of, like, um, of wanting to push, like, because essentially, like, as Israel is trying to push the Palestinians, like, towards, like, the border with Egypt, towards other places, so they can essentially leave, you know, Palestine so that they can take over, I mean, Gaza, so they can take over. It's the exact same thing that happened with, like, you know, the Ovajere who were pushed into Botswana, um, the, um, the Nama who are pushed into the South, like, you know what I'm saying? You can see the parallels with that. Um, the renaming of places um, also, like they were Palestinian names of these places before, but then again, when the Israelis came, they started renaming spaces to give it their own thing, to again, kind of reclaim the history of the space. And the same thing happens in Namibia, where there were towns that had, like Sokopmund wasn't called Sokopmund, Luderitz wasn't called Luderitz. But again, when they took over, they decided to change the name to again, create claim over the space. And then also the Israeli identification of giving themselves like, you know, um, Arabic sounding names. Like, for example, Gal Gadot, like her family made up that name. Netanyahu, like that's not his real name. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, again, it's like trying to create this false um, connection to the land and this false connection to the space so that they can be like, no, but we've been here for generations and centuries, you know, forgetting the fact that they were, you know, Jewish people who were, um, you know, who survived uh, or their ancestors survived the Holocaust and were sent to... Um, you know, to to Palestine. And then again, I think we can't forget that like essentially Palestine is, you know, Germany and the West's like guilt project. You know what I mean? Because after the Holocaust, instead of because a lot of the I mean, most of the people who are murdered during the Holocaust were European Jewish people, right? They weren't Jewish people who were based in um in the Middle East. They were Jewish people who were European. So instead of allowing them to come back to their homes, their businesses or whatever, they they instead decided to ship them all off to the Middle East because the British had a mandate over Palestine and they essentially wanted to make the problem go away instead of um, instead of essentially like reassimilating them. And maybe it's because they didn't want to be reminded of like, you know, the, the horrors that they did, or again, maybe because of their anti-Semitism or whatever the case is. The fact is like, it's very telling how it's the West that decides how they wanted to, you know, correct their, their wrongdoings. And you can also see the similarities between like Liberia where um, you know, the U.S. sent um, former enslaved people back to Africa and be like, hey, we're going to fix, like, hey, like, we're going to fix the problem that we have and we're going to send them back and then everything's going to be fine. So again, it's like this consistent thing of like, instead of taking responsibility for their actions, they try and push it on to, you know, other people and again, continue to push on the settler, you know, colonial dream. Um, the other thing I wanted to talk about, I'm trying to rush through it, I had so many points, was, um, I mean, when the president, you know, spoke out um, in defense of South Africa's case at the ICJ and everything, like I think for a lot for in a for a lot of Namibians, it was a moment where a lot of us felt very proud to be Namibians because we haven't had many reasons to be proud recently. But that was one of the times when we, a lot of people can say that they were proud for our president for speaking out because it was important that he did say that and you know, like to call Germany out on their bullshit in terms of 
um, they can't be the deciders of what a genocide is since, I mean, since they're essentially the expert in genociding. Um, but at the same time, I felt like it was also like, while I'm proud, and I think a lot of Namibians are proud of him speaking out, there's also a level of like, not hypocrisy, but kind of hypocrisy, because I mean, for example, like, we have Heroes Day, right? And Heroes Day was is in August, and it's, I think, the 26th of August, and that's commemorating the uh, the battle of Ongombashi. My Shuwambo is terrible. I'm a Shuwambo speaker. Ongombashi, please don't butcher me for my spelling. Um, and it's basically like a remembrance of that, right? But they, like, as, as Keith spoke, as Toby spoke, there were lots of resistance before that. You know, there was Hendrik Bitboy, there was Samuel Maharero, et cetera, et cetera. And we still don't have a genocide day, right? And it's interesting how we're asking Germany for reparations and we want, you know, monetary um, reparations, which are important. But at the same time, within the country, we don't, we don't offer the same kind of um, reverence to, you know, genocide victims or to the history or the pre-apartheid colonial resistance fighters as we do to the, you know, the Swapo people or the um, Obama people. Um, so for me, I felt like it was kind of like, and it made me, I mean, even that calling it the Namibian genocide, like, it's again, it's this thing of like erasing, like I mean, what Keith was talking about, like erasing that the the genocide did affect specific people. And it's very clear to see, like, if you live in Namibia or if you visit Namibia, like, even though um, apartheid is over on paper, like the majority, I mean, every single year or every few months, the, like the newspapers published that like, you know, 1.5 of Namibians live in poverty. We're a country of 2.5 million or maybe even 2 million, something like that. It's problematic when like more than, the, like more than half of the country is living in poverty, yet, we are a small population, we have a lot of um, resources and we're consistently, like, it's not, the maths isn't mathing, you know what I mean? Um, yo, okay, sorry, back to my points. I wrote so many, I don't know how much time I've left, but okay, cool. The other thing I wanted to talk about is, also is about the physical evidence, right? Like we, like this is, it's terrifying that we're living, like, like that we're seeing a genocide happen like on our phones, you know what I'm saying? Every time you log on, you'll see your images of like, you know, Palestinian um, journalists or Palestinian people themselves like telling us what's happening to them. Whereas, you know, a hundred years ago when the genocide was happening in Namibia, we, we didn't have the same kind of um, like access or visibility that we do now. But also we can't forget, like we also looking at Western media, like it was very clear to see like which, you know, publications were calling this a genocide and which ones weren't, you know what I'm saying? And it's like, it's kind of like this, again, the, the erasure, like it just shows us like the kind of erasure that must have been happening during the genocide before in terms of like, if the the uh, the villain, not to speak in villain and victim's language, but if the villain essentially or the oppressors are the ones who are creating the narrative of the media, then how can we trust the numbers? Because like of, of what's actually happening. Like when we talk about, you know, 40,000 number and, you know, um, 60,000 overhead or people, those numbers were given to us by the oppressor, you know, they weren't given to us by 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 the victims of the genocide. I mean, the fact that we only got Hendrik Bitboy's Bible back not so long ago is problematic. Where is Samuel Mojero's Bible? Where's all of the, like the evidence that, you know, like, cause we, I mean, as much as we were um, oral historians and we passed on storage, like stories in that way, we also had physical evidence of the, um, we also had physical evidence of the genocide. And it's also not, it's not a mistake that, you know, for example, like when, you know, skulls were sent off and um, and the remains of people were sent off to Germany for a study, like, again, like, how can we trust that the numbers that we know are, are real when those numbers were given to us um, by the oppressor? And then it's also this thing of, like, essentially, like, it's problematic for me. I mean, even though, like, we can talk to our elders and our families share on these stories of, um, of you know surviving the genocide and learning about this history again the only quote-unquote empirical evidence that we have is data that was taken by the oppressor or the descendants of the oppressor and it's again it's like it's this thing of like even the information that we have we can't really trust it um, because we're already seeing now what's happening with how the western media is reporting about what's happening in Palestine and what's happening um, you know in Gaza and the West Bank and so on and so forth so how much time do I have? Do I have time? We have maybe about the... eight minutes left. Maybe about eight minutes. So about eleven. Okay. Cool. Okay. Awesome. Okay. So yeah, so that gives me time to touch on the the decolonial resistance here in Namibia. Um. So yeah, I mean, essentially, like as the as the 
born free generation or the people who were born after independence, um, we were raised by parents who, you know, had either some of our parents had, you know, gone to exile. Some of them had stayed in Namibia and we haven't, we hadn't experienced like apartheid in the way that they have. So, but we were, we were raised by people who have PTSD of living in a very violent and very like oppressive time. And because of that, sometimes, I mean, some, some of us are lucky where our parents or our elders are comfortable in speaking about it, but a lot of them aren't. And then also some of us were failed by the education system where the school system would talk about how colonization was good because it gave us medicine and hospitals and the church and the Bible and all those good things. And it erased our history in terms of, um, you know, like our heritage, our culture, our language. I mean, the fact that I'm an Awamba woman and my name is Hildegard Titus is fucking problematic, pardon my French. Um, and it's again, it's that thing of like complete erasure of our our culture and our stories and and, uh, and the narratives that existed before colonization. I mean, the fact that, I don't know how true the statistic is that quote unquote 80% of Namibians are Christians is problematic, you know? And that like people look at, you know, different um, spiritual practices or religious practices that existed before colonization as heathenism or as evil or as, you know, occult, not occult, what's the word? Well, ba they basically vilif they vilify it um, again because, the essentially the colonial project works so well in Namibia, even when we look at the issue of tribalism, for example, occultic, yes, maybe that's the word, but occult doesn't mean bad necessarily, <laughs> but yeah, but essentially like even as Namibia, if you look at the issue of tribalism, you know, that does exist and we can't ignore the fact that again is a colonizer's dream because again, like by having, you know, separated and creating different homelands based on people's um, ethnic background, again, it creates this push of, you know, this, this false narrative of separate but equal. I mean, even looking at the old location, for example, before the black population was moved to the outskirts of the city was like, you know, people were living next door to each other, regardless of their, you know, their, their, their heritage backgrounds. But then for the apartheid system to not only move them away from the city of Santa, but take them out um, and categorize them by race again, just kind of shows that like, it was very consistent to create this tension of, um, of hierarchy and of power systems. So again, like when when Namibians fall into this idea, these I ideologies of tribalism, um, and also these ideologies of like vilifying anything that is our heritage that isn't connected to colonialism, we're essentially feeding into the colonizer's dream. I mean, also when you look at land distribution, like I was at the coast this week, this holiday with friends. And as we are walking down the beach, we realize that all those houses on the coast, like that are looking at the ocean are all either holiday houses or all the, they're all houses that are owned by either the black elite or the white elite. Yet like, or like yet if you go to Angola, which is literally across the border, you can see that everyone has access to the water, everyone can fish, everyone has access to the resources. Where here, even though we are free on paper, the resources are still kept in a very like controlled space and only a few people um, benefit from it. But okay, I think I would probably have like five minutes left. So the next thing I want to talk about was, yeah, so the reason why it's important to decolonize is again, because our, you know, our parents and the people before them had a different struggle to fight and they were fighting like physical fights, um, like, you know, with the war and everything, whereas as while we we still have a fight against like poverty and against like um and breaking down the structures that and the legacies of colonialism and apartheid our fight also has to be a cultural one in terms of like decolonizing i mean the government already started with decolonizing um like street names and stuff like that but also um like for example was the statue in in Sokopmund that has a, a the marina dankmal that literally was put up by the Germans to celebrate or to honor the fallen soldiers who 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 committed the you know the genocide. Um, or for example, in Zupac, there's a statue that also that was put up by Kurfan Francois that honors the Germans who fought who fought at Hornkranz, and we all know Hornkranz was a massacre. So again, the victor essentially not only erases the the history but also makes themselves a the victim. So they they essentially. Yeah, Zoo Park is in downtown Vinton, it's in the center of town. It's actually interesting that Zoo Park was actually built around that monument. So the reason we have that park there was because it was built around um, honoring the the fallen German soldiers who were massacring, raping, and genociding, you know, the local population. And then with Kurt Francois as well, like so Kurt Francois came to Namibia in 1890 or so, 
And um, he started off in Swakopmund and made his way to Vintuk. And essentially, Vintuk had had a settlement there before, um, maybe like 60 years before, um, that was founded by Yonka Fritana. And there was about 400 people living there. And those are people from different groups as well. Um, but then when he came, they kind of dubbed him as the founder of Vintuk, which is part of erasing like the culture and the history and the, the stories of the space before he came there. The same thing that happened in Sokopmund. And then it was interesting that only that his statue was only erected in the 60s, which was, you know, the peak of apartheid, the beginning of apartheid was again to kind of erase that they were that there was, quote unquote, civilization or that there was a settlement here before, you know, colonization and white people came. So I think it's important, like as young people to, you know, interrogate that and also understand that while we do have this cultural um this cultural work that we're doing, we also understand that there's other issues that need to be done. For example, like the fact that, you know, parts of the city don't have access to water or electricity. And that was one of the criticisms that we got, um, like specifically with the, the protest that was, you know, hosted by Keith and Mushanja, who's also, um, I think, joining us today, is that um, people were like, why are you guys protesting about a statue when people don't have water, when they don't have electricity? And it's like, when you're fighting oppression, it's not going to be a one a one solution fight because it's not a one solution problem like oppression and colonization is integral and it's insidious and it touches every single aspect of Namibian life from education from access to healthcare, from housing from like if you look at Namibian if you look at I like you can almost certainly point every every structural problem that we have in Namibia can be rooted down to colonialism. So in that case, like when we do try and decolonize, we have to be active in every single facet of colonization. Sorry, I'm speaking with my hands, but I think my time is up. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> no, thank you. Um, we have some questions from folks and um, thank you very much for that, Hildegard. So um, there was supposed to be another colleague of ours. Uh, her name is Thrive, who was supposed to be able to jump on. But Thrive, there's just some family issues they're dealing with right now, and so they weren't able to jump on. So with that, just given our time, we have about 40 minutes left. We're going to kind of go for Q&A. Um, also, just Hildegard and um, Keith, if you are willing to and you want to, and maybe also Martha, if you wish to jump in as well, we do want to also talk to a new audience. We do have younger activists who are here in the U.S. We do want to, who are, who are on this call, we do want to have you all talk about the contemporary struggles you are doing, such as the LGBTQ struggles, the anti-gender based violence movement stuff, right? Uh, it's also very important to talk about the contradictions that that also is bringing up as it pertains to Namibia post 1990, right? And again, I think to a question in the chat, how do we actually fight all these multiple things at the same time? And I think intersectionality is a term we like to use indeed, but there's also multiple, uh, multiple things that we have to fight here um, simultaneously. So with that, um, Nanre, I think I know there's a question that Nanre has. So what I'm going to do, oh, audience first. Okay, so what I'm going to do is there's two questions that um, were given. I'm going to ask Hildegard and Keith and Mercia, if you have time and are willing, Mercia, I know you may have to jump off uh, to maybe have an attempt at an answer. So I'm going to read these two questions and then whoever wants to um, just answer, sort of go for it. So the first question is from um, uh, Amando. Um, um, and Amanda's asking, is it now safe for us as members of the affected community to feel that our country and its leadership are directly practicing hypocrisy since before the Palestinian genocide, our government has been shying away from the plights of our communities who since ever have been seeking the solidarity of government and its people. But now it's called genocide and yet um, but now it's called genocide with what's happening in Palestine. I think I don't have the last part of that question, but I think that's the gist of the first part of the question. And then Quito is asking, I have a question about organizing in countries like Namibia, where the economic situation has people thinking that the liberation of Palestinians has nothing to do with us without negating the very real economic struggles that we have, right? So I think that second question is like, how do we talk to people on the, you know, on the streets, on the block about Palestine when, they have, when, they're, when they're homeless and they're starving, right? Um, or they're struggling, right? How do we have that conversation? You are the activist. That, how are, are you having those convos or are you not, right? Um, and then that first question is the hypocrisy of the Namibian government. Let's start there. I see other questions are in the chat. 
Um, um, I see Marte has some different, uh, has some questions there. So, um, maybe start off with those two and then we'll get back to a next round of questions. So roughly try to make five, seven minutes, roughly, um, Hildegard, Keith, whoever wants to go first, I'm putting myself on mute. I'll go, I'll go first. Uh, just, just the question about how do you organize amongst people that don't think that the Palestinian struggle has anything to do with ours or that the, the things are unrelated. I think... Mean, <clears throat> Part of part of colonialism, like so the, the reason I loved the Kurt Must Fall movement so much that Hildegard started here, which was basically calling for the removal of a colonial era statue, which was supposed to be the founder of Vintuk in front of the city of Vintuk. Um uh, to that for that to be removed and something more appropriate to be put there, like the actual founder of Vintuk, which was Yan Yang uh, as far as I know. And uh, when we were doing that and people were like, no, there are real bread and butter issues, Keith. Why are you guys protesting something as silly as a statue? I don't think as Black people, I don't know where we would have been taught this, but I don't think we are taught this as Black and oppressed people of, of the world, that insignia and psychological warfare and spiritual warfare is just such a big part of the colonial project as much as like uh, slave labor is because that's how they burn your churches and burn your, your witch doctors and make sure that your folk stories... And, and in any kind of like liberation stories or stories about generational resilience are also erased alongside you becoming slave labor or your land being taken there by settler colonialists. So I, I think not being able to speak to people is part of the colonial project. I think it's one of the intended outcomes for us to be, not be able to find a common ground to be able to organize in a place like Namibia. Because I hear the question, because the question points to the fact that we have to expressly still articulate ourselves and say, hey guys, we actually went through a genocide and after that we went through apartheid. Both of those things are happening right now with the Palestinians and have been for the last, you know, 70, 80 years. So we should not struggle to be able to, um, um, you know, relate with that. But because the, our living situation, like our wages are not a thousand two hundred and a million dollars a month because that's an accident. It's intentionally built in such a way that you don't have enough time to be free enough to not worry about bread and butter issues. Because the moment that we actually earn a decent living and our children go to good schools and we're able to have uh, high job satisfaction um, uh, levels, then we are able to sit under the tree and discuss, hey man, did that white man talk to you the same way he talked to me when I walked past his house? And then we can say, do you guys think that's right? And then we can start organizing. The idea is to keep us so busy and so miserable and so drunk that we cannot organize. Now, as someone that enjoys a drink myself, we must now admit to the history of being paid since the Dutch arrived in the Cape Wine, well, they were not the Cape Winelands by then, but established Cape Winelands in South Africa. And for the last two, 300 years has paid, for instance, the Nama people in alcohol, right? And so we've, as a result of settler colonialism, also have now a genetic mutation, which has, which has created an alcohol dependency in my community that is then rooted in the gender-based violence, gender and sexual-based violence, which is rooted in the destruction of the black home, not the hotel version of the black home, but the black home, which is a loving, thriving space that creates uh, reasonable uh, black people, <laughs> you know, in the world. But I think part of our aggression, if, it, if there were to be one, is to keep insisting that our struggles are intersectional and that they are connected. One thing I loved about the movements that we had in Namibia, like the Shut It Down movement, just if I'm, he look at, correct me if I'm wrong, but it's the biggest post-independence movement led by young people in Namibia in the last 34 years. So Shut It Down was, an, was a very intersectional movement because we, we blamed colonialism for homophobia, obviously compounded by black elites and the capture of black power uh, in, in the contemporary, but we were like, no, but there's a link from homophobia to colonialism and from poverty to colonialism and from landlessness to colonialism. So we said, if we can sit down the question of, of settler colonialism in Namibia, we automatically start solving so many things that we wouldn't have had we not had an intersectional struggle and sort of like drawn the bridge back from there to here. So I think it's difficult, but it's necessary. And the only reason it's difficult is because it was built and structured to be difficult. Uh, for us to be able to tell our people that we're all going through the same thing. Excellent, excellent response, Keith. Thank you for that. Hildegard, do you want to take a stab at the first one or take a stab at this question? Yeah, um, so I'll just stab at both quickly. I, I, I don't like stabbing, but you know what I mean. Anyway, okay, cool. Um, so the first one about the government, I mean, about the government and about how affected communities should look at the government. I mean, I think like one thing about the, the, Kurt, um, the Kurt Farewell movement was that 
it was a practice in democracy, right? Because like my friends and I, we could have gone with a rope in the middle of the night and pulled it down and call it a day, right? But we use the quote unquote democratic channels in terms of like, it was owned by the city of Vintuk and they have a, you know, a council that meets every thingy. And we had to remind them that they represent us and that they are um, like, they work for us, they work for the people. So essentially coming back to it, like, I mean, maybe this is an election year, right? And a lot of young people, for example, don't want to vote because like, oh, who am I going to vote for? The government's corrupt, blah, blah, blah. All, the, all of them are the same. But again, like our democracy only works if we do in terms of like if we vote um, for the opposition, any opposition, just anything. So the, you know, not to tell people who to vote for, but anything to keep the, the ruling party in line and in check and to remind them that they do not run the country. They are the custodians of the country on the behalf of the people. And if they're not caring about things like you cannot be defending you know the victims of a genocide on a national scale but then inside the country you're not developing their their regions you're not developing the education systems you're not developing the people um because they're a, a minority and they are minorities specifically because of you know this genocide i mean people always talk about oh namibia is so little people there's only two million people it's such a massive country um of course there's, there are not that many people because a, a big proportion of them were genocided they were exterminated you know what i'm saying so we have to again like like the government has a lot of work to do, but I think as citizens, we also have to remind the government that they work for us. And we have to do that by holding them accountable, by by showing them that we are, you know, active in our in our governance. And again, like what Keith was saying is when we are working for low wages and people are exhausted, they don't have time to participate in government. They don't have time to, um, you know, hold the leaders accountable because they're literally living um, hand to mouth. And then for the second one where, people, where someone was saying um, about how people don't see the similarities or why they should care about Palestine. Um, if the alarm bells aren't going off for everyone in the planet, anyone who is not from a Western country, if you are not having alarm bells go off right now, then I, I don't know what to tell you because essentially like what we're seeing real time is that this is a genocide, like especially after the um, the ruling of the, um, the court case where they're like, yeah, it's a genocide, Israel, um, Please sort it out. Um, but the, the, the fact that they didn't tell them to cease fire, even though they know it's a it's a genocide, just should be a wake up call to the you know to the global majority that tomorrow it could be us. And to, and yesterday it was us. Today it's the Palestinians. Tomorrow it could be South Africans again. Like a, a, essentially, like oppression to, towards one is oppression to, towards everyone and to, and to the system. And it's again, it's also we have to we can't we can't forget that this is a this is about whiteness, you know, and about um about this concept of whiteness. I mean, whiteness isn't real. And the fact that how, you know, a hundred years ago, Jewish people were not considered white enough, and that's why the Holocaust happened. Yet now, um, you know, Israel, um, Israel has kind of aligned itself with white supremacy in terms of like, you know, pushing the narrative of like, you know, dehumanizing Palestinians. I mean, also even talking about the, like, you know, the vilification of Hamas and all other resistance movements in Palestine towards, you know, What's happening there? I mean, let's not forget that SWAPO was called a terrorist organization. Let's not forget that the ANC was called a terrorist organization. Anything that is meant that is trying to fight against um, oppression is always called a terrorist organization because it's fighting against the status quo that continues to keep people under the system of oppression. So if you are anti-oppression just in your own life, you have you have to also show solidarity for the people. Who are being oppressed and also another call to action is to other namibians like even if you're not part of the affected community from um, the genocide it is your responsibility to put pressure on our government to be like hey like as a vampire people we weren't affected by the genocide as much so when that money comes it needs to go to the regions and the affected communities you know what i'm saying like yes um colonization and apartheid affected us all but the genocide did not affect us all so essentially like this is when like solidarity comes and this is when allyship comes in that's like if your neighbor is starving, it's going to affect you. If your neighbor is being attacked tomorrow, it's you. Like we need to, we need to stop having this like separated idea of like, oh, what's happening across the world does not affect me. I mean, I was talking to a friend, Kito, who I think is also um, here a few days ago. Yesterday, the internet wasn't working right, and we we're like, all and all my friends are calling each other, like, why isn't the internet working? And she was joking that maybe Kuwait cut the internet cords because of you know, everything. And I'm like, yeah, like we live in a global world. Like what's happening in Palestine is going to affect us. What's happening in Kuwait is going to affect us. What's happening in Sudan is going to affect us. And we need to, we need to move away from this idea that we're separated because we're not. So you have to, you have to feel a call to action. If you care about your own oppression, you have to care about the oppression of the next person.
Absolutely. Um, so I know Mar I was going to jump to Marcia to see if they wanted to answer a little bit, but they said they have to jump off given battery um, issues, right? Um, so I'll take a quick one minute, two minute stab at one of the questions, and then I'll move to another one. I think Quito had this. So um, with Amando, um, straight up, there absolutely is hypocrisy in the government doing that, just in a nutshell. Yes, there is. Um, just to say, and I, want, I think that needs to be said and be very, very clear. Simultaneously, there were, and this is now a perspective from myself, someone whose father was was um, very, I wouldn't, say, not, I wouldn't say at the top of software, shall we say, but most definitely more closely connect, connected than most. Um, and particularly when we were diplomats in Germany, there were things that people were trying to do. Um, and then again, and I'll just say this bluntly, we won't go into details of that here, but as many of you, of course, will know, there are disagreements within these communities on what should be happening in terms of land redistribution, who gets what, um, particularly in terms of just some of the sexism and patriarchy within some of the orgs, is it, you know, a man gets the land title and then he gives to the different people, is that what we mean? Um, is it by land redistribution? Is it, does it, is the money go to head of household? We know who that head of household will be. And then they give, you see? So there are of course questions within, and then of course you have those nasty questions about, well, you collaborated with them first. So why are you now asking for some money within? Like I've actually been physically in those conversations. They're very, very uncomfortable and very not nice. And those of you who are Palestinians, they're going through the same thing. Let's be very, very clear. The tension between Gaza and the West Bank and then the diaspora are three very different communities in many very ways. And even the diaspora itself, and we have some Palestinian diaspora folks who are here, they're not living the same life as all those in the diaspora and those in the West Bank and Gaza, right? It's also why for me sometimes I, I try not to, yes, Gaza is like the, the, the point, right? But we also want to talk about this the wider thing. So I wanted just to say that, yes, Amando, I do believe that there's hypocrisy there. I would agree. Um, and then again, in terms of also solidarity, I think also in the Namibian context, what is interesting is a lot of our critique of the government, SWAPO, shall we say, um, the critique of the government, for example, um, um, is interesting because that go very government has historically been Palestinian allies, right? They've historically we've actually trained with the Palestinians. So actually, much of our Palestinian consciousness, third world broad international uh, consciousness does come from SWAPO simultaneously, again, with the contradiction. They also then also are reproducing the same relationships they claim to be fighting during the liberation struggle, right? So this is why I think it's important for us all to understand these multiple layers um, of struggle. So I wanted to just kind of just quickly ask do that. And so now we have a few questions here. Um, some of them are very specific. So, I mean, people can answer as you want. I'm going to maybe give three and then I'll give um, another three. So um, the first question is um, the basis and merits which define the criteria of a genocidal act. I don't know if people want to speak to that. Um, I'm, I'm sure we can drop a link if you want to read something. There, there are some things they have there in the legal term, but just there's that number one question. The second one is, um, I think we've kind of spoken to this, but if folks want to just try again with some more specificity, similarities between the Palestinian genocide and the 1904-1908 Herero and Nama genocide, of course, as Keith has said, to kind of think of the language around this, because many other groups, the San Damara, have also said that, you know, hey, we also were part of this. And then um, the third one, um, and then I'll, I'll just, then we'll move, just we'll move, um, is could weaknesses in the international community be a driving force behind the fueling of the Palestinian genocide? the ineffective administration of the International Convention Against Genocide and War. Um, so question mark. And so maybe those will have those three um, just for whoever wants to kind of jump in and answer. And then I'll ask Nanre to ask her questions and then we'll, we'll, we'll go another round. Um, just the one, I think the last one for me about uh, weaknesses in international communities. You know, I'm gonna, I always say this when I'm in private, private parties where we do intellectual masturbation. And I was asked, do you think that the 1904, 1908 genocide was prepared? Did the Germans use that as preparation to, you know, do what they did in the Holocaust? You know, like I, I could in a reasonable, in a way, see that we were, we were put in camps, concentration camps. Um, a lot of that war, war style of warring or, or, or attacking a people was still very much being ex experimented with. In I think the concentration camp is only 140, 150 years old now as a, as a war idea, if I'm not misspeaking. And I, I, I wonder if 
if because because we're talking about rule based the international rule based order and we've realized through the 19 votes that failed at the united nations that that's not a real thing and then we know we all have a problem with the security council because that's not a that's not a real thing or it's not showing to be a real thing anymore um how much of the ways in which we engage the content do we give our ability to impact our processes away right so when we are all like biting our nails um waiting for icg to, uh, the icj to deliver a verdict that we've known for all intents and purposes may not deliver the kind of relief that we need. It's almost like we become despondent from all over again because we feel like these institutions should uh, represent us and stand for justice and equity. But we see repeatedly that they fail to do that. But we go back and put our faith in the same institutions that fail us every time. Now, I, the reason I'm saying this is because I think the reason I chose poetry as my vehicle for doing my activism is because like Toivo, you just pointed out, the politicians are always at each other's necks about who should get what and who should, what should the genocide be called and who should be the proponents of the genocide and who should be in the negotiations and who should benefit from it afterwards and whatever. But when you do, when you do poetry and you do art, first and foremost, the artist is one of, like you trust the artist generally more than you do a, a politician, right? Because, you know, it's the same way like a racist in South Africa's favorite artist is like Whitney Houston and Lionel Richie, you know? Because that some things that the heart seems to transcend certain things and creates this sort of like a illogical loyalty inside of inside of the head and the heart that has nothing to do with like reality as it presents itself, right? So I'm thinking now, and and, and I'm sharing. I have a powerful example to make my point, and the example I want to make is there was a lady that wrote a poem about Sarah, uh, Sarah Bartman. The poem that brought. Give me a second. The poem. Could someone just see there, maybe, and just add that link, the poem that brought Sarah Bartman home. So the remains of Sarah Bartman were not brought home necessarily by political processes. It, her body was brought home by a woman who heard about this back and forth between having her body be brought home to South Africa and wrote a poem. And this poem just was so striking to the rest of the world that it created political pressure that eventually led to her body being brought, brought home. So, this, so I just want to, in, in part, I think it's important to pressure governance. And I think we're pretty good at it as, as, as young people um, in, in the present continuous. But I think there are other ways to put pressure on communities for things to be able to be stopped. Like I, I think the solidarity protest against Palestine did a lot of work all across the world, whether it's from London to India or from Namibia uh, uh, um, to, to Pakistan. Our civil societies need to be reawakened. And some of the problems that we face that we want to outsource to our governments and international institutions should be brought back home. And we should be in charge of how we think and feel about whether our, our, our struggles are strong or whether they are weak. Thank you, thank you, um, Hilda. So I think for the first question, I dropped a link for the UN to kind of their definition of genocide, uh, you know, the acts so of people want to check that out. Um, but yeah, Hildegard? Yeah, um, so yeah, I wanted to go to the, yeah, the genocide question, which also kind of ties into the other one. So I'm just going to quickly read it. Um, so it says that, in 1948, the United Nations Genocide Convention defined genocide as any five acts committed with the intent to destroy in whole or in part a national, ethnical, racial, or religious group. These five acts were killing members of the group, causing them serious bodily or mental harm, imposing living conditions intended to destroy the group, preventing births, forcibly transferring children out of the group, and victims are targeted because of their real or perceived membership to a group, not randomly. Um, so that's all... The, according to the UN, it's that that's a definition of genocide. Um, and this was in 1948, right? Now, mind you, the predecessor of the UN was a League of Nations, right? And the first, the OG countries of the League of Nations were Great Britain, France, Italy, and Japan, right? And um, so Great Britain was a big colonizer, France was a big colonizer, Italy was a big colonizer, and Japan was a big colonizer in um Asia. And it's interesting how like the people who essentially were one of the biggest colonizers or oppressors of the world are the ones who are de de defining what a genocide is, right? Um, so it, it's again, it's, I mean, even the fact that now that like Israel is saying that isn't a genocide, that America was saying it's not a genocide, that Germany, the UK, etc. The people who are the experts in genociding are trying to decide what a genocide is. But I think essentially a genocide is like when you're trying to culturally physically, spiritually, um, and emotionally eradicate people, that is genocide. It doesn't matter if it's two people, uh, 10,000 people, like there is no number for a genocide. The, what makes a genocide a genocide 
is the intent to eradicate people. I mean, even if you look on the global scale in terms of like how, you know, even um, the hatred towards the LGBTQI plus community, it could technically, you know, also um, be considered a genocide, even though it's multi, it's across, um, it's across the world, it's across country. I mean, we can see the rise of, you know, um, of homophobia rising and transphobia rising across the world, like that could also be technically considered a genocide. So for me, a genocide is essentially just trying to wipe out people's right to existence. And I think, I mean, what's missing in this genocide definition is also the cultural genocide, because like, again, genocides are not just about physically killing people. It's also about culturally and spiritually people, like as Namibians, like they are people who are still connected to their heritage and their history and their culture. But we also have a, a big task on our hands in terms of undoing the cultural genocide that has happened to us. Like, I mean, I don't speak my mother tongue. There are other people who don't speak their mother tongues. So the fact that my name is Hildegard or that I have a, a German sounding name, it's also a form of like, it's a form of erasure and it's a form of like, it's a very insidious form of um, erasing our history and who we were before. But yeah, that's how I would define genocide. Thank you, thank you, um, thank you. So I was gonna ask Nanre because Nanre had a question that I think is really good to ask to the panelists. And then I'll ask one others from things that people have put. Marte has asked a very good question about reparations. So I was gonna ask Nanre if you maybe could ask your question. Then I'm gonna ask uh, one from the a previous list and then I'm gonna ask Marte's question. And then that might be just the last round of questions. And then for the final 10 minutes, uh, however else time we have, I really do want Keith and, and Hildegard to also talk about the contemporary struggles that you guys are engaged with because we have comrades here who want to connect. And I think that ultimately we don't just want to talk together, which is good. We also want to build together and we have the technology technology to do so. So with that, I'll go to Nanre. Yeah, and I think in that vein too, um, uh, if everyone, especially the panelists, Hildegard and Keith and Marta, if you all, if you also have handles, um, public handles that you want people to follow, Instagram, Twitter, um, wherever people can follow you, websites, um, I think that would be great. Um, and we're saying I'm I'm saying we're saving the chat so we'll also be able to add this when we when we upload the the documents when we upload the video. Um, yeah, so just uh, I have two questions and this kind of kind of comes as my my background as an educator. Um, so first of all, um, to Keith, um, I know you spoke and this I th I think Hildegard also spoke to this. You talked about he spoke about ex uh, narratives and you spoke about um the idea of narratives. You said that um there's been no chance kind of to build. The narratives of history. Um, so I just wanted to know, and I know you're a writer. Um, what steps are you, um, as organizers, taking to build and properly, uh, properly constructed narratives, um, and to kind of reverse that erasure and culture, um, that that ha that has taken place. Um, and Hildegard, I know you also spoke a little bit about that, and you spoke about the um the colonizer's dream. And my question to you um is. Um, you also spoke about the born free generation, and I'm wondering for you, like, what is the born free generation's dream? Like, you talked about the colonizer's dream, but and you talked a bit about access to resources and benefits and your decolonial work. Um, so, what does what does the new Namibia um, that is not that is the born free generation's dream, and what does that look like? And just and again, I think speaking to, <laughs> we want to know more about your work. So, I think this goes in line with what Toivo was asking is. Um, to just learn more about like the organizing work that you're doing right now. And would love to, I, I've learned so much and so just excited to hear a little bit more. And then finally, just, I don't know if this question maybe can come at the end, Toivo, as um, I don't think I'm going to speak again. But um, I know a lot of people when I speak, um, and, and we mentioned this before about how do we speak to people on the street? How do we speak to people in our different um, worlds, you know, in Africa and the African diaspora about standing in solidarity with Palestine? And sometimes people push back and say, well, why should we stand in? Why should we be in solidarity when nobody stands up for Africa, right? Nobody is talking about Sudan. Nobody's talking about the Congo. Um, even if we're, we're talking now about, you know, history, but well, there's also uh, historic, what has happened historically. And, you know, as I, I like what Hildegard said about this, there's genocides taking place right now that are not being talked about. Um, so how do we... As, as Black organizers, as African organizers, respond to this really 
So this anti-blackness that we know is pervasive in the media, in, in the world, that erases our struggles, not just our historic struggles, but our present day struggles. And say, you know, we can still stand in solidarity, but also how do we convince people? How do we respond to that? Because I think for me, it, it touches it touches me because we all only have specific bandwidth, you know, and this is a reality. Um, I think that we all face as organizers. Where do we put our energies? How much energies do we put into this? And how do you, how do you all uh, navigate that as organizers who are, are doing stuff on the ground, but also trying to stand in solidarity with what's happening in other parts of the world? Thank you so much. So I think with that, I, those are a handful of questions. So how about you guys just try to answer those and then we'll see if I, we have time for some of the other ones, which seem to be a little bit more straightforward. So yeah, Keith or Hilda, whoever wants to go first, please. So for me, around the question about narrative. So one thing I do, we spend a lot of time, a couple of us in like archives and museums, trying to like dig for history that we might have missed. We read a lot of literature. Some of the books can also be shared. Henry Bedboy's Red Book is a very good source because even in that book, there's a letter where, where Henry Bedboy writes in 1884 and says, I've heard you white boys have split up the African continent. I'm writing to you to let you know that Namaland, the greater Namaland, is not up for occupation. So we have a letter from an African leader from 1884 that expressly, expressly um, um, rejects uh, settler occupation in Namibia in 1884 through uh, Berlin Conference. You have other such circulars that tell a story of such incredible resistance um, and, and foresight and almost prophetic foresight about what was going to happen to the Nama people and the Hero people in Namibia, um, probably based on the history of what happened to them in, in, in South Africa around the, the, the Western and the Northern Cape. Um, you first go into these archives and I think you first meet a version of yourself that you didn't learn in school, that your German teacher never told you about, that your father is too tired to rehash to you, that your grandfather who died too early could never have recounted to you. And then beyond that, I think you, 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 you must assume such an uncomfortable ownership of that history and of the reshaping of that narrative that certain things almost fall away without you realizing that they are falling away because you're entering, even though it's politically charged, as such a fuller, more richer version of yourself. And this is the reason that I have such a troubled relationship with museums and with archives, even though I'm obsessed with archiving now as a descendant of the genocide. I have a very tough time thinking about museums and experiencing museums. I'm doing a project right now with, uh, with the um, Namibian um, uh, Art Gallery, the National Gallery and with the Museums Association. And, it's based on 23 repatriated objects that came from Germany. And each one of the artists involved is supposed to take or build a relationship around one of the objects and sort of create an expression that will be exhibited in March uh, this year. And uh, in 1960 and 1970, German, most German museums or European museums recoated a lot of their artifacts that were in their, in their, in their whatever creepy places they keep our ancestors' bones. Um, and so a lot of these things that were taken from us can no longer be engaged, particularly the things that are like material, not the like the minerally things like the Benin bronzes and stuff like that, more like the little cloth bags and the whips and the chains and the, you know, the beaded work and all of that stuff. We can't really engage, but we spend a bulk of our lives as, as dispossessed black people trying to get those objects back. But I feel like that creates a, a vacuum in which we're not longer, we're no longer able to create continuous cultural uh, uh, artifacts or, or things that engage us in the present continuous as cultural entities. So I'm like, we, I feel like there needs to be both like a going back and finding out who we were, but in the same vein, rigorously creating the versions of ourselves that we want to encounter in the future or that we want our children to encounter in the future. So I think it's a fine balance between like realizing that a narrative has been stolen and rewritten and then also kind of like making effort to ignore certain things and spend more of that time creating a new narrative or creating a narrative that breaks that apart as opposed to just like living your life with the imagination of a dispossessed person, but balancing that with creating the version of yourself and creating the narratives that you that you think will empower your people. So I think that's how I deal with like um, 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 that balance between going back and trying to retrieve myself from history versus like trying to fetch myself um, fetch a, a version of myself that I could use for the future or that would have utility for the future, you, either whether it's for me or my children or, you know, black people everywhere. Um, Hildegard, please. 
Yeah. Um, okay. So I'm going to answer about how, you know, um, like people can show solidarity and assist the work that we're doing here in Namibia. I mean, I think ever since the genocide discussion has happened, I, mean, I can say maybe the past five, seven or so years, I mean, in the past couple of years, it's really pushed up. But there have been a lot of like Western academics, Western activists, Western artists, et cetera, et cetera, coming to Namibia, both POCs and non-POCs coming to, do, you know, engage with this work. And it's very disheartening. I mean, I'm not going to speak for everybody, I'll speak for myself, for like us activists here, like we do this work, you know, because we like because it's important to us. Like we don't, this is unpaid work. This is, um, these are all like labors of love because we think this is important. And it's kind of disheartening when we see like, you know, Western institutions, whether they're universities, um, cultural institutions, governments, giving money to um, Western scholars, Western activists, Western artists to come to Namibia and to talk about our work and talk about our histories. And instead of amplifying the voices of people who are from here and people whose lived experiences it is to deal with this, um, you know, with this legacy of, you know, colonialism and apartheid. So I think one thing it's like, it's, it's like, it's, I think this was a part of an avenue of allyship. It's also knowing to like, you know, instead of, like, instead of taking up the, um, what you call it, taking up the, the space with your own like I mean it's it's really it pisses me off I mean I understand and it might come from a good place but it's also problematic where like I can't I mean he just mentioned like I can't mention how many people have interviewed me in the past year alone right and how many theses I'm featured in and articles and whatever and I don't even have time to write my own articles and theses because I have to run around to pay my bills or I have to run around and do other things and people are building their careers off our work where we are literally struggling. Like, I mean, I'm, I still understand that I'm a very privileged person and I, you know, I've, I've had, you know, a good education and I've had lots of, you know, I'm a privileged person, I won't lie about that. But at the same time, when it comes to activism, like these are like, it's a full-time job. It's not something that you can do, like if you want to push forward, um, it's not that something you like, it takes up a lot of time. And it's, 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 and I think the onus should be on our allies in the diaspora, in um, other countries and people who are coming from backgrounds that have, um, infrastructure to do this work, to share this work with us, because a lot of times we are forced to work with, you know, Western academics or whatever on these projects, and we're always treated as a second, um, kind of a second fiddle to whoever they are. And yeah, like exactly, they're building the careers of our work. And also another thing that we need to talk about is like our government, right, doesn't prioritize arts. It doesn't prioritize culture. It doesn't prioritize these things. And the genocide, like I said, was also a physical thing of killing people, but it was also a thing of killing culture and heritage and, you know, um, and who we were. And because our government, I mean, our government has its problems and there's corruption and whatever, but they're focused on building schools. They're focused on building hospitals. Okay, they haven't built a hospital in a long time, but anyway, that's another story. My point is like, they have other fish to fry or they don't prioritize the cultural work and the arts. And, you know, and, and again, the arts is a way that we can, you know, how society can heal in terms of, you know, talking about these very difficult topics in a way that is tangible and accessible to people from whatever sorts of backgrounds. So because they don't prioritize that, then cultural workers, artistic workers, people who can interrogate these histories and the lived experiences and, you know, who can have resistance toward it are not, um, are not um, seen or are not given the resources to be able to do this work. So, I mean, when we talk about reparations, yes, the land needs to come back. Um, yes, um, you know, there needs to be monetarily um, amounts to it, but we always have to recognize that we lost generations of culture, generations of history, and that also has to be a cultural reparation in terms of like, not only of what was lost, but also what is being lost now because our government doesn't have the resources or they choose not to allocate resources to our cultural and artistic healing and arts are part of healing. And then the other thing I wanted to talk about, okay, yes. Um, how born freeze, what's the born freeze dream? The born freeze dream is for our parents to heal, you know, and our grandparents to heal and for us to have an intergenerational healing because it doesn't help that we as a born free generation are healing and our parents are still dealing and caring with the trauma that they went through, you know, during apartheid or that our grandparents are carrying the trauma that they went through in, um, you know, during the genocide and before, 
I mean, our great grandparents, you were, my mathematics is terrible. But my point is like, we want an inter intergenerational healing. We want an interracial healing, we want an intersectional healing. I mean, if you look at Namibia's problems with GBV, if you look at Namibia's problems in terms of, you know, the, 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 the rising homophobia and transphobia that's happening, these can all be connected to this trauma that was inflicted because of colonization. And us, ultimately, I think for me as a born free, my dream is to intersectionally heal and like Keith was mentioning earlier, like we have friends who are German Namibian, you know what I'm saying? Or we have friends who have like, whose grandmother was, you know, um, sexually assaulted by a German soldier or whatever. Like our, our histories are complicated. They're not black or white. They're very entangled. And while we recognize that, you know, just because you're a German Namibian today, it doesn't mean that you committed the you know the sins of your grandfather but you but his sins still benefit you today so our call is to like you know to white germans or, or white namibians or white germans or whatever in terms of understanding that we don't hate you for what your ancestors did but we are expecting you to help deconstruct the system that continues to benefit you based on what they did you know what i'm saying like we're like we're not hateful people like and i think also sometimes like why a lot of white namibians don't interact with this work is because they think that we're going to do to them what what their ancestors did to us or that we want to take away their houses or whatever where it's in, in reality we're just trying to create a more equal and just society and understanding that like essentially I mean maybe we'll take some houses but anyway my point is it's more a thing of like balancing the scales that have been consistently for decades um, ensuring that they are considered the top of society where the rest of us, the majority of us are, you know, treated like dirt. Like it's so it's like, it's, I, it, I find it so difficult to live in Namibia and see a white person who does not engage with this work. Like, how can you just like, how can you just be in your own bubble, not recognizing that the privilege that you are experiencing now is built off the oppression that your grandparents and your parents, um, I mean, apartheid was not that long ago. Like I'm 32. Um, and I'm literally born one year after like independence, like again, like it wasn't that long ago and people are still benefiting from that. So I think the whole call is to call people to create a more just and equal society. And in order to do that, we need the people in power and people with privilege to deconstruct or help us deconstruct the system that benefits them. Absolutely. So folks, um, I know there's other questions and I think we answered some of the other questions that we didn't get to. So if you didn't get your question asked, I apologize. We will try to have other events going forward. Uh, I just wanted to really take this um, time to number one, uh, thank all the panelists, number one, for really taking your time, particularly those who are descendants of the genocide. I always, these things are very important. And as Keith saying, having to do nine such interviews last year, this is some of the stuff that is, it, it, it's very tough. You know, it's to recreate, to go back in this trauma again and to deal with this and to discuss these things with people who you don't know on an online platform that's going to get shared, God knows where in this social media technology age, right? Um, but I really, really, really want to thank uh, them for taking their time, for being vulnerable with us, for being open with us to do this kind of work, right? We will have more of these conversations. Um, um, as the year progresses, right? We also, again, want to, uh, re, uh, that's, that's number one. Number two, I want to thank those who registered and who were able to come to this webinar. We will post this thing up. Uh, I want to say in the next day or two, um, we'll get it posted up. So um, we'll, once it gets posted to YouTube, we will share with people. We ask you to share. For some of you, uh, the, 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 the youth, right? Since I'm old now, apparently at 35, who know how to cut these videos up into like, you know, 20 minute sections. Cause I know you, you guys know your own attention span. You're not listening to things two hours straight. Um, so the idea is how we can maybe cut things up or maybe get pieces of it shared in, 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 in more uh, digestible ways, right? So most definitely when we share these YouTube to people, feel free to chop it up and do different things so we can, uh, you know, so you can um, uh, share these things, right? Um, that's number two. Number three is again, while this has been a lot of Namibia, uh, et cetera, again, this genocide with the Palestinians is happening now, right? They are killing these people now, and these people are saying 25,000 dead. You must just double that number because these people have not gone through the rubble of actually the destroyed areas of Gaza, right? Um, and uh, it's just wild, right? We just, we just don't have these, and people will be dying over the next few days, okay? So I think that um, we need to always center Palestine. Wherever you are, we need to be protesting these things. Right. And also part of the reason why we wanted this uh, 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 event to move the way is ceasefire now and Palestinian liberation now. Absolutely. Right. 
Um, uh, 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 all of us again have different orientations around these politics and what should and should not be done. So I won't, I don't want to get too deep into these things because um, you know, we all have our different uh, where we stand on this. But the, what we can agree on is Palestine liberation is real. You must get involved in it wherever you can be. You must learn about these issues, right? You must begin to also fight for injustice where you are. Again, and I say this very directly, and this is to my comrades in the United States, right? Palestine will never be free as long as the United States government as an empire exists and continues to perpetuate itself the way it currently does as an imperialist power. Until there is liberation in this country, there's apartheid right here in Atlanta, Georgia, right here, right now. You understand? So if these blacks here in Georgia can't get their land, you think you're going to get land in Palestine? No. <laughs> so until liberation is here, Stop Cop City. Yes, indeed, Keith. Stop Cop City. The environmental struggle back home in Namibia also is getting itself underway, given some of the illegal fracking and the oil discoveries that they've been having in Namibia right now. That is on Herero and Nama, over Herero and Nama land and San land and Damara land. So many of these oil discoveries you're seeing now in Namibia, right? People need to check this. It's on the land of people who have been, who have been uh, committed genocide against. Okay? So that's actually very, very, very important to understand. And also, slight note, once oil seems to be discovered in Namibia, right, all of a sudden the U.S. embassy has upgraded itself and now has become this huge big embassy in Namibia. They have completely, the U.S. embassy was like tucked away in a small area because U.S. was supporting apartheid. So we were very critical of them. But now the oil is here in Namibia. Now the embassy is huge. It's becoming big, big building, right? Telling you what their, it's a fortress. It actually is a fortress, which means, you know, right there in, in, in right there in, in Ventuk, right? So I want you all to think about that, right? So with that, folks, again, this is the kind of the broad spectrum of things, particularly for a younger generation of activists. I don't want people just to see Namibia as some of your the elders in the movement will have maybe a certain starry-eyed vision of Swapo and them because Nyoma, the anti-apartheid days, etc. But we need you to reorient yourself to a new generation of activists, indeed inspired by those cats. But we are trying to push this revolution further and far, further and farther. So with that, thank you all very, very much. Um, uh, we're going to uh, end this thing. I'm going to stop recording now, and then we're going to end everything. Thank you all very much. Uh, please enjoy the rest of your days uh, of your of your day. Um, uh, and we will uh, stay tuned for more events coming um in the future. Thank you very very much. Aluta continua.